Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, belated nonetheless. I hope that you had a great time celebrating uh, this past week. Uh, we have an opportunity now to dive in together, thankfully, uh, into God's Word. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for coming out this morning, spending a little time with us here on your holiday weekend. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called It's Fine, I'm Fine, Everything's Fine. I don't know if you remember, but a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Dan made this statement. He said, an honest answer to a good question can set you free. Today we're going to look at a really good question that Jesus asked. The interesting thing about this question, though, is that all of you already know the answer to the question, which may make you sit and think, well, Pastor Don, why would we get together on a Sunday morning and study a question that all of us already know the answer to? To which I would say, better question, why would Jesus ask us a question that we all already know the answer to? Because he wants to set us free. Uh, again, we're going through a series, It's Fine, I'm Fine, Everything's Fine. It's week two of a two-part series, so today is the last part of that series. Uh, we labeled it this because this is the answer we give most of the time when somebody says, how are you doing? Even though for the most part, when we answer it this way, we're not telling the truth, uh, this is how most of us answer that question. How are you doing? It's fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. It's all good. Everything's great. I'm blessed, can't complain, like that kind of an answer, even though we know deep down that most of the time that's not true. Inside, we're not doing fine. Inside, we might be tired, angry, sad, hurt, anxious, worried, afraid, frustrated. Yet when someone asks us how we doing, we tend to answer, fine, it's fine, I'm fine. Everything's fine. You know what I'd love to do one morning? I would love to give our greeters at the door a syringe full of truth serum. And like as you come in the door on a Sunday morning before they ask you how you're doing, they just give you a quick little injection. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Might be a little scary, but it certainly would be fun. I think we'd have a whole lot more people sign up to be greeters at the door if we supplied them with a syringe full of truth serum every time somebody came in. You just give them a little plug, and then you ask them, how you doing? I think, honestly, more often than not, the answer that we would get if everybody came through these doors being honest and open, the answer that would probably reverberate most with most of you, the answer would be, I'm worried. I'm concerned, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm fearful, I'm worried, I'm worried about my kids, I'm worried about my job, I'm worried about my health, I'm worried about a particular family member or a relationship in this family, I'm worried about my parents, I'm worried about the economy, I'm worried about my grades. If I'm honest, I'm, I'm worried about my finances. I'm worried about what others think of me. I'm worried about my future. If I'm honest, I'm worried about this country. I'm worried about the world. We all have these worries. And truth be told, if we walked in the doors this morning and we were all injected with truth serum and somebody said, how are you doing? Most of us could probably say, I'm worried about at least one of these things right now. Which brings us to the question that Jesus asks, a question that all of us already know the answer to. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, Jesus asks this question, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And we all know the answer to this question. We all know the answer to this question is no. No, you can't add a single hour to your life by worrying. In fact, we know the opposite's true. We know that by worrying, you actually can subtract hours off your life, right? Worrying is not good for your health. So, so why do we do this? All of us know the answer to this question. None of us can add a single hour to our life by worrying, yet at the same time, all of us do it. We all know the answer to this question. 
we just don't know what to do with the questions. It's interesting because this question can actually be translated two different ways. It can actually be translated, and both would be accurate. It can be translated this way, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? But it can also be translated this way, can any one of you by worrying add a single cubit to your height? Now, a, a cubit back in Bible times was a, a unit of measure, like a meter or a foot or a yard. And it was a distance between your elbow to the tip of your finger. So obviously, depending on how big you are and how tall you are and how long your arms are, it's not going to be a totally accurate measurement. But in Bible times, a cubit was the length of your elbow uh, to the top of your finger. And it could be translated both ways, this question. But either way, the point is the same. You cannot add any length. You cannot add any height to your life by worrying. You can't add feet, and you can't add hours. And by a show of hands, how many of you have actually worried so hard and so well that you actually worried the solution to your problem into existence? How many of you have ever done that? Like you worried so hard that it actually brought the answer to your problem by worrying. So we know that doesn't work. Worrying doesn't add to our life. We know it doesn't change things, but we keep doing it. So, so I come this morning asking, why do we keep doing that? And most of us would answer, why do we keep doing it? Because i got a lot to worry about. That's why I keep worrying. Look at all the stuff I've got to worry about. I've got to worry about my kids. I've got to worry about my family. I've got to worry about my parents. I've got to worry about my future. I've got to worry about my grades. I've got to worry about the economy. Like, I have a lot to worry about. That's why I worry. But I would challenge you on that. You have a lot to be concerned about, but concern and worry are two very different things. And as we go through Scripture together, we're going to see that together. You may have some things to be concerned about, but that's different than worry. And when concern begins to morph and grow into worry and anxiety, we may find that indeed we are not doing okay. When Jesus uses the word worry here, he uses a word that literally means anxiety expressed as fearfulness. When Jesus talks about worry, he says this, this is anxiety expressed as fearfulness. The word really means to worry anxiously. And even just by posing this question, Jesus points out the foolishness of our worrisome lives because it doesn't add anything to our life, it doesn't change things, and we all know it actually makes things worse. Headaches, tension, high blood pressure, short tempers, ulcers. And Jesus says, listen, can any one of you by worrying at a single hour to your life, we all answer no, and if you can't even do something that simple by worrying, then what makes you think it's productive at all? This is actually what Jesus says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. That's a command from Jesus. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. To which most of you think, all right, I, I, I hear you, but like, how do I do that? And what I love about Jesus here in this section of Scripture is he just doesn't tell you what to do. He tells you why. And so people can tell you what to do all day long, but if you don't understand the reason why behind it, like it's kind of hard to do. But Jesus is very clear here. I'm not just telling you not to worry. He's going to give us a number of compelling reasons why we shouldn't worry. He goes on to say this. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Look at the birds. If God takes care of them, and you're just not more valuable than birds, you are much more valuable than birds, then Jesus is saying it would stand to reason that if God takes care of the birds, then don't you think he would take care of you? He goes on to say this, look at the birds of the air, or, hold on, where are we going here? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, 
which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? If God takes care of the flowers, which are here today and gone tomorrow, which are temporal, don't you think that he would take care of you who are eternal? If, if God's going to take care of grass and birds and flowers, things that are temporary, things that in the end will not be here, don't you think he would take care of you? Don't you think he would not just clothe you, but he would much more clothe you? And then he says the kicker, oh, you of little faith. See, pretty much all our issues when it comes to God are faith issues. They're trust issues. You can pretty much reduce every struggle that you have with God to a faith issue and a trust issue. And, and worry is a faith issue. Worry is a trust issue. It's a, do I really believe that God has my best interest in mind? Do I really believe that God will not just take care of me, but will more than take care of me, that he will much more take care of me? Do we really believe that God loves? Do we really believe that God cares? Do we really believe that God provides? Because then look at what Jesus says. He says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Don't worry. Why? He says, because your heavenly Father knows what you need. And what's implied there is this, if he knows what you need, even better than you know what you need, and he loves you, don't you think that he would provide for you? If you are even much more valuable than birds and grass and flowers, don't you think he would provide for you so much more? Listen, we can trust God because God is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-loving. And if he was only two of those three, we're in trouble. If God was all-knowing and all-loving, but not all-powerful, he'd know what the right thing to do is. He'd want to do the right thing, but he didn't have the power to do it. Or if he was all-powerful and all-knowing, like he, he knew what to do and he had the power to do it, but he didn't love you, you couldn't really trust him. Or if he had the power to do something and he loved you enough to do something, but he didn't know what it was he should do, you'd be in trouble. But because we have an all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God, you can trust him. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Instead of running around worried about what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink and what you're going to wear, God, God knows your needs. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But also notice the subtle point that Jesus makes here. When we run after all this stuff, when we're anxiously, fearfully chasing after what we're going to eat and what we're going to drink and what we're going to wear, he says you're acting like a pagan. In other words, you're acting like someone who doesn't believe in God. Which sort of makes sense, right? If you're running around trying to fearfully, anxiously like gather all this stuff that your Heavenly Father has said He'd provide for you, then, then He says you're kind of living like someone who doesn't believe in God. The pagans chase after these things. Last week, Pastor Dan talked about our obsession with chasing. And there is no rest in chasing. And many of us are exhausted because we're busy chasing things we don't need when Jesus has promised us that God will provide the things that we do. And that brings anxiety, and that brings worry, and that brings exhaustion. So Jesus says if you really want to chase after something, I mean, you really want to go at something, you want to go at something hard, he says go after this, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And when you do that, all these things will be given to you as well. Put first things first and let God take care of the rest. That's what Jesus is telling us here. Chase after something bigger than all of this. Don't run around like pagans, running anxiously, fearfully, pursuing things that you don't even need, knowing that your heavenly Father knows what you actually do need. He says, you just seek first his kingdom and God will take care of the rest. What this does not mean is it doesn't mean you shouldn't be concerned. It doesn't mean you shouldn't plan. It doesn't mean you shouldn't try. It doesn't mean you shouldn't work. It doesn't mean you shouldn't prepare. It just means stop with the anxious fearfulness. Like lay that aside. Your heavenly Father knows 
what you need. Jesus goes on to say this, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. See, God gives you enough grace for today. And you can't use today's grace on tomorrow's problems. And you can't use tomorrow's grace on today's problems. God gives you enough grace for today. Today. So just to review, here's what we've learned so far. You shouldn't worry. Jesus said so. You're like, I get that. I hear that. He gave me a number of reasons why I shouldn't worry. But what should I do? Because there's a lot of things I'm worried about. There's a lot of things, okay, I'm not going to use that word worry anymore. I'm going to use the word concern. There's a lot of things I'm concerned about. So what should I do if I'm not supposed to worry? Glad you asked, because we're going to find that out together this morning. How is it that I can have all this going on in my life and yet still have peace? Because there are a lot of things I'm concerned about. There are a lot of things I could be worried about, but you're telling me I shouldn't worry, but I am concerned. How do I have peace in the middle of this? How can I be okay when everything around me isn't? Well, we're going to find that answer in the book of Philippians chapter 4, and that's actually where we were last week. Last week, you remember, Paul, the Apostle Paul, took us there, or Dan took us there to the Apostle Paul's writing in Philippians 4, teaching us about the secret of contentment. Today, in that same section of Scripture, we're just going to back up a few verses and look at what Paul says about how in the world we can find peace in the middle of all of this. How do we find peace in the middle of all of the concerns and dispel all of the anxiety and fear and worry that easily comes with all this? How can we be okay even when everything around us isn't? So to see who was paying attention last week, and Pastor Dan's not here, so that's good, although it is being recorded, so he may check it, and in which case, if you do give the right answer, you may get bonus points from him. Who wrote the book of Philippians? Go ahead, nice and loud. Paul. Where was Paul when he wrote this book? He was in prison. That's an important thing to remember as we go into this section of Scripture, understanding the context of where Paul is so that we understand this isn't just some pie-in-the-sky writing by some guy who's, you know, off living the life. This is a guy who's in jail as he's writing this. And this is what he writes. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Again, this is a guy sitting in jail. Do not be anxious about anything. Two things we want to notice about this, and one is not obvious and one is obvious. One is this word anxious is actually the same word that Jesus used when he said, do not worry. It means that anxiety that produces fearfulness. So Paul and Jesus are talking the same language. Like, literally, they're, they're vibing. Both what Paul is saying and what Jesus is saying goes together. Jesus says, do not worry. Paul says, do not be anxious. Do not have that anxiety that leads to fearfulness about anything. That's an all-encompassing word. Anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Yeah, but what about... No, anything. Yeah, but you don't understand, my sister... No anything. How can I possibly not be worried about anything? You don't understand. Anything. Do not be anxious about anything. Anything. Your kids, your future, your health, your job. Again, concerned? Okay. Planning? Yes. Working toward? Yes. Fearful anxiety? No. Whether it's your kids, whether it's your job, whether it's your parents, whether it's your finances, whether it's your grades, whether it's what everybody thinks about you, whether you're in jail or not. Remember, Paul is in jail as he's writing this. If anybody has something to be worried about in this moment, if anybody has something to be anxious about, it's Paul. He doesn't know when he's getting released. He doesn't know if he's being released. His life has no guarantees as he writes this. It is full of unknowns. Yet he sits there and writes, do not be anxious about anything. Then he goes on to say this, but in every situation, in every situation, again, notice how all-inclusive this is. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every 
situation. You mean that situation? Yeah, that one. In every situation? Every situation. Whatever situation you are in right now, Paul says, don't be anxious about it. And you're like, yeah, but you don't understand. No, Paul's in jail. He does understand. He says, listen, whatever situation you find yourself in, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, all situations. He has no idea what the future holds. And you're not supposed to be anxious about anything. And in every situation, you're supposed to do the instructions that he's going to give next. You're like, like for me, do not be anxious about anything. Like, and, and most of us live here, like I worry all the time. Like, I got a lot of stuff to worry about. If I'm not worrying, I begin to worry that I must have forgotten something to worry about because I'm supposed to be worrying about something. So if I'm not worrying right now, then it must mean I forgot something, and that begins to make me worry. But Paul says, no, no, there are no concessions, no exemptions, no caveats, no exceptions. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, and again, he's in jail. This is what he says to do. In every situation, by prayer and petition, and with a heart of thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. Instead of being anxious about it, instead of worrying about it, instead of getting fearful about it, Paul says, here's what you do. In every situation, in any situation, do not be anxious. Instead, in everything, with prayer and petition and a heart of thanksgiving, Make your requests known to God. Pray. And you're like, man, I came to church for that. Like, that's so cliche. Like, pray, that's the answer. We'll get to why that's the answer in a minute. But a lot of times things are cliche because they're true. And Paul knows the truth there. He's living it. He says in this moment, listen, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition and with a heart of thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. If you remember last week, Pastor Dan said that thankfulness is the gateway into God's presence. So like, let's open that door wide. Let's go to God with a heart of thanksgiving. First, and thanksgiving in a situation, I can't be thankful in a situation. I mean, Paul's in jail. It's not saying your situation is not hard. We're just saying Paul gets it. And he's saying whatever the situation is that you are in, come to it with a heart of thanksgiving and make your requests known to God. The God who loves you more than birds. The God who loves you more than the flowers of the field. The God who loves you much more than birds. The God who loves you much more than the flowers of the field. So here's what we're going to do then. Instead of worrying and instead of being anxious, instead, in every situation, in prayer and petition, with a heart of thanksgiving, I'm going to make my requests known to God, especially the ones that are causing me to be fearful, especially the ones that are causing in me anxiety. I'm going to stop. I'm going to lay that aside, the worry aside, and what I'm going to do is pray. With a heart of thanksgiving, I'm going to make my requests known to God. I'm going to talk to God about them because ultimately, most of the time, he's the only one that can do anything about it anyway. In every situation, with a heart of thanksgiving, I'm going to bring it to him in prayer. The God who is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-loving. So I know, I know some of you, and I know some of you are thinking, well, if he already knows, then why would I bring it to him in prayer? If he already knows what I need, why would Paul's command be to then bring my request to him? He already knows what I need. Good question. Here's the answer, because here's what happens when you do that. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When you do that, when you come to the all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful God and bring those requests to him, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You'll have God's peace. The opposite of worry. The opposite of anxiety. The opposite of fear. And ultimately, isn't that what we all want? Peace? I mean, isn't that ultimately what this season's all about? The proclamation of peace? Listen, we know this to be true. Peace does not always mean the absence of conflict. 
It doesn't mean the absence of turmoil. Right? Jesus came to bring peace on earth. He brought peace on earth, but we know that there's still conflict. There's still turmoil. It's the quality of life you can have in the middle of it. It's the quality of life that you can have in the midst of it. It's a peace that makes no sense in light of the situation you're in. That's why it's called a peace that passes all understanding. You're like, in this situation, it wouldn't even make sense that I can have peace. You say, but when you come to God, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God, with your prayers and petition and a heart of thanksgiving, that peace will guard your heart and mind. And you might actually be okay, even when everything around you isn't. Here's one thing I've learned as a pastor. People have a low tolerance for uncertainty. Here's one thing I've learned about myself and people. We don't like the unknown. We don't do well with the unknown. Even in the small stuff. I don't like waking up in the morning not knowing what the gas price is going to be that day. I don't like not knowing what the weather is going to be this Saturday. It might rain. It might snow. There might be a hurricane. It might be a thunderstorm. I don't like not knowing what the weather is going to be this weekend. I don't even like not knowing what's for dinner. And as an aside, if that's for dinner, I'm not eating it because somebody cooked broccoli and threw that on there, and that's disgusting. That's a vile weed. I'm not eating that. I don't like not knowing what's for dinner. We don't like the unknown. The unknown causes us fear. And the reality is this, because what happens is because we don't know, our mind starts going in a million different directions of what could happen and should happen and might happen and may happen. I don't know what's for dinner. What if it's something that has broccoli on it, right? And I begin to start worrying about that. I don't know what this weekend's going to bring. What if it's going to rain? What if it's going to snow? What if there's going to be a hurricane? And my mind starts going a million ways, right? I, I don't want to get that lab report back from the doctor because I don't know what that's going to say. The unknown causes us fear because what starts to happen is our minds start to extrapolate and compute every possible permutation of every possible thing that could possibly happen might happen could happen should happen may happen and we, we start worrying about a million different tomorrows that may or may not ever come to pass i mean honest how many of the things that you've worried about have actually ever come to pass like so few of them yet our mind starts racing and going in a million different directions when we when we face the unknown we begin to worry when we face things we can't control we begin to worry but here's the choice that you have in the current situation that you're in and you only have one of two choices in the current situation that you're in right now that is causing you anxiety that's causing you worry that is causing an anxiousness that leads to fearfulness you have one of two options one is to worry one is to worry and just keep replaying that thing in your mind and thinking of every possible permutation, of every single computation, of every single branch, of everything that could possibly happen, using today's grace tomorrow, trying to use tomorrow's grace today on things that may or may not ever happen, and you get anxious and stressed and afraid, not adding a single hour to your life, or in everything with prayer and petition and a heart of thanksgiving you can make your requests known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You can, as Scripture says, take all your anxiety and cast it upon him because he cares for you and experience peace. Here's the good news this morning. And I don't say this lightly. This can be something that can literally change your life. If you are a good worrier, you can be a great prayer. This is exciting news for some of you. If you are really good at worrying, you can be really good at praying because the difference is so subtle. Worrying is just going over and over and over something in your mind that you really can't do anything of and getting all fearful about it and anxious about it. Prayer is going over and over something in your mind and giving it to the one who can do something about it and leaving it with him and resting and trusting in that. What would happen if every time you began to worry, you just stopped and said, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. It gets me nowhere. Instead, in everything, in every situation, in prayer and petition, with a heart of thanksgiving, I'm going to make my request known to God. Like if every time you begin to worry about that thing, worry meaning that anxious anxiety that brings fearfulness, like if every time you began to go there, you just caught yourself and said, I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do, instead of just going over and over this thing in my mind, which is getting me absolutely nowhere, instead what I'm going to do is go over and over this thing in my mind with God. 
Man, if some of you did that, you'd be praying all day long because you worry all day long. But if you caught that and flipped that worry into a prayer, some of you would actually spend the entire day praying, and that is a great place to be. Spending time with the one who can do something about it, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God and leaving it with him. Next time you catch yourself praying, check your, next time you catch yourself worrying, check your spirit. Just say, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk with God about this. I'm going to pray. You'd become a tremendous prayer. And I guarantee your life would be transformed. So instead of worrying, in every situation, in any situation, prayer and petition and a heart of thanksgiving, make your requests known to the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving God. He promises that his peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What would happen if you actually took Paul's command to heart? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, would be yours. It'll stand guard. It'll stand guard like a sentry at the door of your heart. It will stand guard like a sentry at the door of your mind. And you might indeed find that you are fine, even though everything around you isn't. Paul might say it this way, that the only way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. So we wanted to provide you guys an opportunity. Pastor Dan said last week, we got to take time, we got to like reserve the time to do this. What I love about flipping your worries into prayers is you don't even really have to reserve the time because we worry all the time. Just every time you worry, just say, oh, no, no, it's going to be pray time. Whatever anxiety you've come in with this morning, whatever thing you're fearful about, whatever thing on that list is causing you to move from concern to anxious fearfulness, like here's an opportunity in prayer and petition with a heart of thanksgiving to make your requests known to God that you might experience his peace. 